Welcome everyone to the Wheeler Centre. Uh, my name is Maria Tomarkin. I'm leaning forward. I've been told not to lean. It's <laughs> happening already. Um, I'm a writer and a cultural historian and I'm here. We're all here to talk to Sarah Sintilis, a writer, a critical theorist, a scholar of religion, an activist, a teacher, mm. many other things. And I imagine that those uh, different identities are inextric inextricably linked. Uh, Draw Your Weapons is Sarah's fourth book, and that's the book that we're going to be talking about today. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging that we are meeting today on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation, and I would like to pay, pay respects to their elders, I'm going to get there, past, present and emerging, and to the elders of other communities who may be here in this room and you never know who is in this room. But I also would like to acknowledge the difficulty of this acknowledgement, how not to make these words empty, how to speak them with my being and not with my throat. Is speaking always already compromised? Perhaps we'll talk about that. We'll talk about looking, definitely. Um, how not to let an acknowledgement, um, even a heartfelt acknowledgement, become pseudo-acknowledgement, and Sarah talks I think very interestingly, maybe not even in your, in your book, maybe in your interviews, about pseudo-acknowledgement mm. of the costs of war and of the kind of traumatic legacy of war, um, so, and photography and pseudo-acknowledgements, something for us to talk mm. about. Um, and just a reminder to put your phones on mute. Uh, bear in mind that this event is recorded. Uh, the bookseller selling Sarah's books tonight at the back there, and Sarah will be signing her book, uh, is the indestructible and resilient paperback books. And um, I think that's all I need to tell you. And uh, we're going to speak for about 45 minutes, maybe 50, if we can't stop, uh, and then we're going to open up to your questions. And just the request, um, please do not produce orations, please do not give speeches, Please ask Sarah questions. Mm -hmm. If you can make them a one-sentence question, uh, you will get an extra bonus point or two, <laughs> uh, maybe even special desserts. Um, Sarah and I, yeah, phones on mute. That's becoming relevant straight away. Um, Sarah, I know you've been asked this question many times, but I, I, I will ask you um, anyway because I'm that interested. Uh, you were studying to become a priest. You were at Harvard Divinity School. Um, and then you saw a photograph on the uh, front page of the New York Times, and you no longer was going to become a priest. And I just want to, uh, and, the, and, and I think you will speak much more eloquently about that photograph, so I'll just say that it's uh, a photograph of an Iraqi uh, prisoner being tortured by American soldiers, and uh, most people probably would be able to call up that image um, without much effort, a shocking, distressing image, uh, the one we are most familiar with, uh, or most of us are familiar with. But I just want to slow down that moment of a photograph kind of changing a course of your life, because mm -hmm. it, it sounds sort of, you know, cinematic. I can imagine a trailer. One woman's, you know, <laughs> quest for God becomes one woman's <laughs> quest for truth and justice. Please let there be a trailer like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think there should be a trailer. <laughs> Perfect. And I think we need to talk about it. But if I could just ask um, you to kind of bring us into that moment, you would have seen many, many shocking photographs by, by that mm -hmm. stage. As a, as a person who is engaged in the world, mm -hmm. who is very interested in looking, and we'll be talking about looking, not looking. W what happened for you in that moment of seeing that image? Why was it so transformative? The image that I saw was the man standing on the box with the hood over his head, and he had his arms out from his side. And it just, um, there's been, uh, the book started with two photographs, one of an old man being given a violin, which I saw in 2006, and the first being this torture photograph. And it just stopped me in my tracks. I think it was partly my own privilege that made me think it was something new. Mm. America has not been engaged in torture for as long as it has existed. Um, but what really got my attention was that the image was talked about as a crucifixion image. Mm. Um, and I, was, I had been in the process to be ordained as an Episcopal priest. I was getting my doctorate in theology. Um, and I wanted to understand what was happening when this Christian narrative of salvific violence, the idea that 
Jesus was tortured and killed to save the rest of us? What happened when you put that narrative on the body of a tortured Muslim man being tortured by possible Christian American soldiers? Um, did that make us see torture as something that should be stopped? Or did it perhaps make us think that torture was divinely ordained and what would keep us safe? Um, so I knew right away I needed to change my dissertation topic. I was writing about imagination as a tool for social justice, the idea that we need to be able to envision a better world in order to be able to bring it into being. Um, and I changed my topic. My advisor quit. <laughs> I uh, realized I had to teach myself visual theory, ethics, aesthetics, photography theory in order to be able to write about those images. But I felt that... Um, they demanded something of me and I needed to become the thinker and the viewer and the activist that they um, called for. And can we talk, you've mentioned the second photograph that kind of structures your book. Yeah, so there are two axes or two rivers mm -hmm. flowing through your book. I like and, that. Uh, and the, can we talk a little bit about that um, second photograph of an old man with a violin? And I'm really struck by this... Um, relationship that you form with these two photographs where they literally change completely, uh, well, the, certainly the first photograph changed the direction of your life mm -hmm. and the second photograph also kind of was transformative in, in many ways. Do objects call out to you? Do photographs speak to you? I mean, do you feel that calling where you need to pick up the phone uh, talk to people, go and sleep in their houses. Uh, uh, it's all very, You're making me sound uh, a little scary. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm making you sound exciting. Uh, she is an adventurous. But, mm -hmm. but is there uh, a real sense of a photograph or perhaps it goes beyond photographs calling out to you in this way? I, I mean, these two photographs did call out to me that way. I saw this picture of this man. Um, I was back. I had left Harvard and moved to Idaho, and I was back to take my exams. I think that's what I was doing. And a friend of mine showed me this photograph, and it was this man. He was luminous. Uh, he was 83 years old, 82 years old. He was being handed a violin. And even before I read the story, I thought, I need to know this person. It was the height of, of Bush, um, which seemed like it was a low point for us. And... <laughs> We've managed to travel mm -hmm. ever Are you feeling lower. Nostalgic? <laughs> yeah, I am feeling nostalgic. I'm yeah. like, can't we have some some some, uh, bush, some, some more fake bush. wars and <laughs> yeah, torture again? Mm -hmm. um, but I, he, I, when I read the newspaper story, I learned he'd been a conscientious objector during World War II. His roommate had been Japanese American in college, and his roommate's family was interned. And Howard decided he couldn't support the war in any way once we started locking up our own citizens. So he protested that by walking out of the work camp where conscientious objectors were placed. He was fighting forest fires in California. And he was arrested and put in prison. He was released and then drafted a second time. He said, again, I won't fight and I won't go to your work camp. And they put him in prison on an island off the coast of Washington. And in prison, he built a violin. Um, and his wife wrote, out the instruct typed up the instructions from a library book and sent it to him in prison. And he never completed the violin. And the picture that I saw was his grandson handing him the completed violin because he'd been in um, furniture making school. And I did, I thought, I need to know you. I need to know what it means to live a life where you say no and you accept the consequences for your refusal. So I called him, he answered the phone <laughs> and I told him I wanted to write a book about him and he said yes, and I could tell that his mind wasn't all the way there. So I thought, I'll, I'll write you a letter, I'll explain who I am. And I never heard from him for months. And I would call the number back and he wouldn't answer, so I worried he'd died. And months, almost after I'd forgotten about him, he, his daughter called me and she said she'd just found my letter and that it was, she'd been going through her parents' things months before and she'd said to the universe, I need someone to write a book about my parents. And she said that was May 25th. Your letter is dated May 25th. Come see us. Mm. So I traveled to their house. I slept in their house. And <laughs> see, there is an explanation, yeah. a boring explanation yeah. for this. But, yeah. but you asked me whether I think yeah. I respond to photographs yeah. that way. And yeah. when I was reading your beautiful essay, No Skin, I wrote all over the margins, vibrant matter, vibrant matter. I don't know if you've read that book by Jane Bennett. She's a no, philosopher. And she talks about... Um, 
everything in the world as being animate and acting on us in the same way that we act on them. And when I taught her book, I had a student who was um, from South Korea, and she came up to me crying. She said, I really thought my English was getting better, but I read this book. I don't understand it at all. I think she's saying that this glass is alive. <laughs> and I said, no, you got it. <laughs> you know, don't worry. But I, I think I've been trying to pay attention to the world in that way, that it acts on us and we mm. act on it. And um, photographs work that way for me. Mm. Um, I wonder, not to be your psychoanalyst, or perhaps I could be for two minutes, I wonder about Harvard, the, the kind of the deep impact of his story on you. I wonder if, to some extent, uh, it's about, or it has something to do with the fact that um, at the time of the Second World War, when he was a conscientious objector, um, that position was still meaningful, mm -hmm. that position was still possible. Uh, it made a lot of sense, that kind of principled stand. And mm. as you say, uh, he was prepared to go to prison uh, for it. Mm -hmm. And his wife supported him. She's mm -hmm. extraordinary. Yes, yeah, she is. Um, I wonder whether you can imagine uh, meaningful pacifism in 2018, mm. where wars are everywhere. You write in the book. You say that you've been writing this book for 10 years. Commiserations, mm -hmm. and that <laughs> uh, for all of this period of time, America has never not been at war. Mm -hmm. So inescapable, diffused, being fought uh, in all kinds of ways, not just on battlefields. Of course, you write a lot about drones. And um, do you feel that there is a way to be Howard mm -hmm. in 2018? Because I wonder whether you're drawn to him because he's signalling a possibility that is increasingly difficult to imagine. What would it mean to mm. object conscientiously in that way, in a meaningful, principled way, to wars? I've, I've asked myself exactly that question. What does civilian conscientious objection look like? I mm. think we don't have a draft in the United States now, but we do have um, an economic draft. My student, Miles, who I write about in the book, who was stationed at Abu Ghraib prison, he went to war in order to get money to go to school to sit in my classroom, which raised and troubled all kinds of questions and troubled my own pacifism and highlighted my complicity in a new way. But I've been asking myself that question, what does it look like to stake your life on something, to say no in a visible um, way? I think um, the students who are leading revolt against uh, about gun control in our country are showing us a kind of way now. Um, I think that I've started activism on a on a local scale um, to support immigrants in my community, to try to disrupt the deportations that are happening, which are just on a tremendous and devastating scale. Um, but I think part of the brilliance of the war machine, if you want to call it that, or or the violence machine outside of war is to make it nearly impossible to target your attention in any particular way because it's almost like the war has become an unmanned aerial vehicle like a drone. Mm -hmm. There's no one to there's no one in the cockpit. <laughs> like who do you point to to blame? Who do yeah. you resist? Where do you resist? What site? But at the same time you can resist anywhere and everywhere because it's everywhere. Um, so uh, my teacher Gordon Kaufman who was a theologian, he would say, he, he was a champion of uncertainty, that uncertainty was an ethical position that you had to take to treble authoritative claims or to treble the kind of definitive seeing that drones demand or that war demands. Um, and he said that uh, uncertainty, it doesn't mean you can't stake your life on your beliefs, but it does mean you can't kill another person over them. So I've been trying to think about radical nonviolent activism and what that looks like. I think, I don't know if it made the news here, but Standing Rock, the protesters at Standing Rock in the United States who went and put their bodies where they were trying to run the pipeline. Yeah, we, we did think um, about... That is a, a beautiful yeah. model where it's based on principle and community and activism and commitment to nonviolence. So I think um, in the United States, indigenous communities, youth, and uh, Black Lives Matter are really showing us what that might look like. Um, does this book feel like an act of resistance and conscientious <laughs> objection to some extent? It was almost a subtitle. They wanted to oh, give really? it the subtitle, A Conscientious Objection. Okay. And maybe you were it wise to res no, 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 you don't want to spell I, things out like no, that. No, I wanted it to be yeah. looser, um, yeah. so I refused that. Mm. Can we talk, um, and there's a lot that I want to ask you about photography, but I, I, I am very intrigued by the kind of the trajectory of this book. 
Uh, it was supposed to be a novel. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't. It didn't happen. Uh, you, you say you broke it into a thousand different pieces, and then you try to create um, this new new being, this new thing. Well, if things have feelings, yeah. then <laughs> yeah. it is a being. It's alive. It's, it's alive. Your book is definitely yeah. alive. I can see it vibrating <laughs> quietly there. Um, why do you think now, now that it's out in the world, I mean, you may have thought all sorts of things while you were tortured by it and while um, you were wrestling with it. And, of course, there were moments of joy and grace. I'm not mm. suggesting that it's always a very messy and difficult yeah. experience. But looking at it now, why couldn't it be a novel, do you think? And why did it have to be kind of smashed into a mm. thousand different pieces for it to find its ultimate shape? I think someone else might have been able to write it as a novel, but I couldn't. I, had, I worked on it for several years as a novel until I had a friend, we'll say ex-friend, who told me that it wasn't working. Um, and Don't shoot the messenger, Sarah. No, I, 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 I had to make a list, like what she said about me, what she said about the book, <laughs> what she said about the market. Um, but she said, you know, write it true. This is a true story. And mm. that was so wise. Um, it is a true story. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to honor Howard's life in a, in a, in that way, and I wanted to honor Miles that way. Um, but I did, I shattered it into thousands of pieces and then had to put it back together and rewrite. And I used a very physical form of revision. I cut it up, I literally cut this book up maybe 75 times and taped it physically together with scotch tape on the floor of my house all over the kitchen. I'm trying to figure out how these pieces fit together, but it had to be told that way. It had to be told by juxtaposition, putting things together that were unexpected. It had to have the white space um, that lets the reader animate it, you know, that it becomes a different kind of book depending on who reads it. And it's um, almost, to me, I understand it as a negative theology, um, like a, a speaking and then a speaking away, um, a saying and then an unsaying, so that mm -hmm. it can become um, a point to a kind of transcendence or a complexity or an uncertainty that wouldn't be possible if I just told it as straight prose. Um, so that's what I had mm. going on when I created it. And I think that um, I really love the fact that Howard and Miles, who are the two kind of figures in the book, as well as so many other people, thinkers, theorists, artists, there are a lot of artists, mm -hmm. and you write beautifully about them and their work, but they never meet. There is no, no epiphany. There is no moment when you're all in the room and you're weeping together. And there was just, in the novel. That's the, the only good yeah. thing about the novel. <laughs> I made Howard and Miles meet each other. Yeah. But. See, I'm so pleased they don't meet in the book. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I, that's why the novel didn't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's so important that uh. they're not forced together hmm. uh, in, any, in any way. Uh, and yet they coexist because yes. you've made the space for them to coexist. Um, I want to talk about, of course... Uh, Photographs of violence, death, destruction, trauma, mm -hmm. loss. Uh, there are all kinds of arguments for why these photographs are incredibly problematic. You know, the violence porn or disaster porn, you know, the idea of a spectacle mm -hmm. turning people's lives being eviscerated into a spectacle, mm -hmm. the idea of um, the role of photography in colonial and neocolonial neocolonial projects, and you write about that, as well as the role of photography in slavery, mm -hmm. uh, all those things. And so it's quite, um, I suppose, uh, a comfortable position maybe to declare that the ethical, moral response to photographs of violence is to look away. Mm -hmm. And I think in many ways this book is looking at looking and looking away <laughs> yes. and not looking. Um, and and this book exists because you did the looking. Mm -hmm. You looked, and that looking undid you, in a sense, and then you had to write this book. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in you thinking about looking and uh, not looking. And Susie Linfield, who um, is one of the, one of the writers uh, you talk with, you talk mm -hmm. to, you, mm -hmm. you bring into the space of the book, who wrote a beautiful, beautiful, is that the right word? A powerful, very powerful book on uh, photography of violence, cruel, it's called Cruel Radiance, Radiance. is that right? Mm -hmm. And she says, oh, we have come to believe that not looking is this kind of, you know, powerful moral position and an and act of great deep ethical seriousness. We're giving it too much credit. Mm -hmm. So and it's a minefield. Yes. What, and, and I guess maybe even if you could talk 
about the evolution? Because I imagine that your thinking on looking, not looking would have changed many times mm -hmm. in the course of writing this book and perhaps even before. What, what have you been kind of thinking about this question? It's changed so many times, and Susie Glenfield, that book was one of those that like smacked me across the face. Yeah. You've spent the last three years thinking about this wrong, <laughs> and then I had to do it again. But yeah. um, when I first started, I when I first um, started really thinking about photographs of violence and what they did or didn't do, and how we should look or not look. Um, I was teaching critical theory and critical thinking in a university and my poor students, I made them look at image after image after image after image after image. I just felt it was imperative that we look and that we be witnessed, learn how to witness um, the horrifying things that we do to one another in images. Then I um, read a bunch of theorists who suggested that um, we don't know how to look at images, that we have an emotional response to them and we think we've done our job and we look away. And I thought, well, oh no. <laughs> so I stopped showing them, no image, no image, no image, no image, no image. <laughs> then I read Susie Glenfield and she said, that's your being narcissistic. Um, that question, should you look or not look, is actually putting the attention on the viewer and your attention should be on the subject. Um, the power of photographs is that we no longer have the alibi of ignorance. We have to look and we have to be accountable for what we see. I thought, well, okay. So my students and I would decide together. Your poor students. Yeah, my, they were like, what are we supposed to do? Um, we, would, we, we would look together. We would decide together, should we look or not? Who, yeah. who will our looking help? Who will, who will our looking harm? Is looking away at the ethical violation? Is looking an ethical violation? Um, and then I read this most profound book called The Civil Contract of Photography, which I use a little bit in the book, but I read the whole thing, and it is, I, I can't recommend it mm -hmm. enough, but it is, it, it's cr crazy. It's really, really thick. <laughs> it will take you a long time. But it's called The Civil Contract of Photography by Ariella Azalea. And she has this passage where she's writing about um, the daguerreotypes taken during slavery, where this man named J.T. Zeely, um, no, a daguerreotypist was named J.T. Zeely, but he was hired by Louis Agassi, who was a biologist and a eugenicist. In um, He was lived in the United States, actually, when I lived in Cambridge, the elementary school down the street from me, where mostly black children went to school, was called Agassi, which is just crazy, because he was this racist who believed God had two moments of creation, one for white people and one for people of color, and that justified enslaving them. And he wanted to use the camera to capture their subhumanity. Mm -hmm. So he hired this daguerreotypist and traveled to South Carolina and took photographs of fathers and daughters who were enslaved. Um, and I've always had struggled looking at those particular images because they're this image where the you're asked to take like a lynching photograph or like the torture photograph, the the view from the oppressor. Your the camera is the oppressor, the violator. Um, but she says that you have to imagine that room and kind of like zoom above it and imagine who was in that room. So the the people who thought they owned other people, the father and the daughter, the fathers watching their daughters be stripped by these photographers, the photographer and this biologist, and how those all those positions are negotiable and the, the photograph could have gone a different way. Um, and she said that the people who were standing in front of the picture and allowing their picture to be taken imagined you as a future viewer who would see at some future time the violence they were experiencing and turn it into an emergency and do something in response. And that was like the Linfield. Mm. I thought, okay, you have to look. You have to look and not only look, you have to learn how to become a citizen of photography and hold yourself accountable to the bodies that you um, see. And this idea of um, a new kind of citizenship being constituted by uh, documentary photography mm -hmm. of violence and destruction. That yes. is a really, really striking idea. And it takes us away maybe from, and Susan, and, and you write about Susan Sontag kind of mm -hmm. also talking about this, uh, this idea that empathy, the uh, kind of the emphasis that we place on empathy and empathetic response. We don't mm -hmm. want just to have soggy emotions. We want to be, you know, deeply moved and have an empathetic response. And 
basically this whole idea of citizenship says, no, mm -hmm. we're not interested in your empathy. We're interested in reconstituting this as a kind of a, as a civic exchange. Exactly. Exactly. She says we're citizens not of nations but of images. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I love that. She takes empathy out of it. It's not that we're... Um, we're we're shared. Our our job is to restore citizenship to those who who's had it have mm. it had it taken away by the camera, by the state, by whoever. Yeah, that that is an incredible. I think that book, no matter how big and thick it is, it needs to be read. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, thank book. you for introducing uh, yes. me to it. Um, mm. It's a real discovery. So you, you've gone through look, don't look, look, don't look, <laughs> look. Yeah. But then uh, um, there are no images in this book. Yes. Was this a Torturous. I don't know why I use the word torturous. I know, uh, I perhaps, uh, perhaps I should <laughs> perhaps I should take it back and not use it in this way, mm -hmm. especially now. Was it a difficult decision? And I'm thinking that Philip Gurevich, for instance, mm -hmm. in his book, um, I think Standard Operating mm -hmm. Procedures, is that right? He doesn't use images either. Oh, he doesn't have images in that no. book. No, oh. no. So I'm, I'm interested in your decision not to use images, but at the same time, you, for instance, include. Uh, quite lengthy quotes um, detailing different torture methods. Mm -hmm. So you're making us look, but in language, mm -hmm. not in pictures. Yes. Was it, did you know that you were not going to include images or did you go back and forth on this? At first I, well, I sound like I really can't make up my mind, but at first I thought I no, would. No, uncertainty, remember. Uncertainty, uncertainty is important. Is the, it could have principle. been another way. It is, yeah. it's an ethical principle. Yeah. Um, I. I didn't want any images in the beginning, and then my editor and I talked, and um, he thought, well, maybe there should be images. Um, and we, then we ended up deciding maybe one image per chapter. But in the process of looking for which image would it would be, I realized they would become these kinds of illustrations, and they would be flat in a way that I didn't want them to be. I, f I wanted them to first exist in the mind of the reader. And then if they wanted to go look and see them, they can. They're all easily found. Um, but I wanted that, that imaginative experience first. Um, and then I did put long descriptions of torture because I put the passages of the torture memos, which were the memos that emerged out of the Bush White House by his lawyers there, um, to argue that enhanced interrogation wasn't torture because torture requires the intent to harm so if you don't think it's going to hurt someone, mm. it's not torture. Yep. And I had been looking at, by the time I read those documents, I'd been looking at torture photographs for a long time. And I nearly vomited um, from those torture memos. You can mm. find them online. There was something about the dispassionate language and the, the legalese and this like tortured, lo whoop, this um, strange logic and then the very delicate descriptions of what you would do. Like there's a one passage that talks about where you should slap someone on the face, that you should take off your jewelry, and you should keep your fingertips between like underneath their earlobes. And so it's this recognition of the, the tenderness of another's body while you're doing this horrific violence. Um, and they're redacted, which is interesting to me. I'm really interested in redaction. Um, so I wanted to treat those as texts that could be rewritten and reimagined. Um, what did you want from the reader? Did you want a kind of a, the struggle within, I don't want to read it, I must read it. Like the struggle, I cannot look at it, I must look at it. Um, I, I, I don't know. I hadn't thought about it that way. Mm. I just wanted to have evidence that we knew exactly who did this. I, mm. I remember in the United States when it started coming out, oh, maybe there were lawyers responsible for this. Oh, maybe there were people in the government who authorized this. I was like, I live in Portland, Oregon, and I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. this, is, this is on the internet. Anybody can find this out. So I, did, I, I wanted people to know that these documents existed and... Um, that it wasn't an accident, that it wasn't, torture wasn't part of bad apple, wasn't bad apples, yeah. it was, it was sanctioned policy. And that's one of Filip Gurevich's argument, that those soldiers who we see in the photographs have been framed, mm -hmm. to use the kind of photographic term, to take the blame yes. uh, for what was the um, clear policy, as, exactly. as, as you write about in the book. Um, one of the questions that you are um, I, I feel you are um, addressing 
um, in really complex, powerful way in this book, is the question of whether photographs of um, violence and destruction, whether they can change anything uh, in this world. And you quote Virginia Woolf, and when she was asking that question, hopeful that photographs of terrible um, brutality um, inflicted on human bodies, that, that uh, those photographs can stop wars. Mm -hmm. We are, of course, not in a position to ever wonder that. We know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. But do you think they can do something, those photographs? I think photographs, I, I think they're extremely powerful objects. Um, Ariella, Ariella Azale says that photographs can transform the world, and the reason they haven't isn't because of their failure, it's because of ours, that we don't know how to look at them, and we don't know how to turn our emotional response into concrete political action. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about, in part because of um, the conversation that I had with Teju Cole in Adelaide, about the way that the most visible images almost redact the images that we never see. So I've been wondering, um, in our time of hypervisibility, what is it that we're not seeing, and how does this sense that we're seeing everything really obscure that perhaps we're seeing nothing? So <laughs> I think that um, if anything is going to help us bring into being the world that we want to see that's more life-giving for more bodies, it will be images, it will be art um, that help us remember that the world is made, that human beings can produce new objects in the world, and that remember, teach us a more kind of careful seeing of one another, um, an uncertain, troubled kind of seeing that I think is the opposite of war. There's a lot of um, art and artists in this book, a lot of really striking um, artistic projects that you describe and bring into, into the space of the book. You have um, the kind of complicated, fragile hope that art is some kind of answer, some kind mm. of counterforce. Does it feel to you like a force still in this world? And, and I'm thinking particularly about Mohsin Hamid, um, writer Mohsin Hamid, mm. perhaps uh, people would know his latest book, Exit West, Yes, um, and uh, Reluctant Fundamentalist was his early work mm. that was very famous. And he talks about perma-war. Hmm. you know, the state uh, of kind of never-ending war that never never ceases. And he talks about that as kind of producing the ultimate effect of us being scared of ourselves, hmm. of the kind of ever-present fear that we turn against ourselves hmm. as well. And, of course, we are rendered paralysed mm -hmm. through that. So do you... Do you are you able, with all the looking that you have done, all the thinking that you have done, all the interrogating that you have done, are you able to hold on to a sense of art as a counterforce? I do. I mean, it's the only thing I can hold on as to as a counterforce. <laughs> I think the first radio interview I did for this book, um, I had no warning. I was listening to the new. They were doing like the news clip, and they were like, Sarah Santillas will be with us talking about Draw Your Weapons. Sarah, do you think art can stop war? Like, comma, <laughs> dummy. You know, like, what's wrong with you? Um, but, I, but I do. You know, part of, part of this um, ever-present, ongoing, everywhere war is a war of images. Um, that's, that's what interests me about drones, in fact. Um, I'd spent all this time reading about photographs and what troubled objects they are and how uncertain they are and how they've always been doctored. And here we have something that we send with cameras and based on what we see in images, we're gonna kill people. That seems to me very dangerous. So we better get better at looking at one another. Mm -hmm. And I think art teaches us how to, how to remember that everything that we see is limited, is framed, is false, is missing, is uncertain, is not true. <laughs> you know, that our lenses are continually warping how we approach the world. Um, and I think art is the best teacher for that. Mm -hmm. um, you write quite a lot about internment camps. Um, in your book, and we of course have uh, detention centres mm -hmm. in Australia. Uh, most of them by now are offshore. And I'm really interested in, and, and that's the kind of fundamental difference between say Europe, where refugees are on the streets mm -hmm. and you cannot, I mean, you, I'm sure you can not see them, you mm -hmm. can look and not see. Uh, and this idea of hypervisibility that you were talking about, mm -hmm. and Ted Call is talking about, that that's really important. Mm -hmm. But you know, so I, I was thinking, um, you know, people like to kind of, say that the reason why certain kinds of policies uh, persist in Australia is because we do not see refugees 
on the streets. Mm -hmm. They are not, and yes, they come to us mediated by photography and, and some kind of uh, reportage, but not being confronted by them in our everyday life, not stumbling upon their bodies and their mm -hmm. humanity as we go to work or to a shop. That is stopping some kind of fundamental change from taking place. Mm -hmm. But then I think maybe it is an illusion. Maybe it is possible to be surrounded by all manner of people in distress, people at the utmost limits of precarity and fragility, and not to see them yes. as well. What, what, what do you think? Can you um, solve our problems in <laughs> Australia? <laughs> I know you're flying to New Zealand tomorrow, so can yeah, you just sure. spend the rest of sure. the day? I'll uh, solve your this? refugee problems yeah, and you can please solve do. our presidential problems. Okay. <laughs> um, it's interesting, when we were talking, I was thinking about my own small town, and um, we have a high population of, of recent immigrants from Mexico and from Peru. We, we live with our neighbors all the time. Our kids go to school together. We are in um, grocery stores together. We live next door to one another. And yet we are um, shipping off people. You know, they'll drive on the street and they'll have snow on their license plate. They'll get pulled over by the police. They'll go to jail and they'll be sent to a detention center and deported, even though they might have lived in the country for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I don't think proximity is um, any kind of guarantee of anything. Um, I just think of Rwanda, you yeah. know, or, yeah. or any, any kind of um, constructed difference that ends up turning towards violence. I think we have to learn how to see one another better. Um, and I've been interested in the photographs that make their way of, of refugees um, or refugees in distress and how they seem to make a difference for a minute and then they mm. fade from our minds. Um, and I think that's, you write about that also in No Skin, about that idea where you pay urgent attention to something for a minute and then you're on to the next thing and then you're on to the next thing. And um, there's that sense that nothing can be done. Um, but I think it, the solution's not that hard. We... Um, my next project, I'm thinking about kinship and belonging and um, the stories we tell about which bodies we're supposed to tend and which bodies are not ours to tend and which bodies don't belong to us. And I think that um, kinship has been framed as something that's about nation or something that's about blood, like the nuclear family, but what if kinship were about um, tending one another, that we become kin with those that we choose to protect or to care for. I read a beautiful theorist named Elizabeth Freeman who said that kinship is the practice of one body garnering all the resources they can to, to care for another body. It's a practice. And I think we can get much better at it. Um, as you were talking, I was reminded, and I'm sorry I keep coming back to Philip Gurevich, but he's kind of <laughs> in my head quite a bit, and I'm reminded... Um, um, about his book about Rwanda genocide mm -hmm. um, and um, trying to remember the title. Uh, we would like to inform you that tomorrow we shall be killed with our families, mm -hmm. something like that, an mm -hmm. unforgettable title. Uh, but he, um, he writes about survivors of uh, the um, genocide that hopefully we all, we all still remember. There have been many other genocides since then mm -hmm. and um, what is our capacity for remembering genocides? And you actually talk in the book, you say, how can you forget? Yes, I have forgotten many times. It is mm -hmm. possible to forget something that has made a hole in your heart mm -hmm. and yet somehow with everything that is coming at us, we are able to forget. Mm -hmm. um, so Philip Gurevich writes about um, how he found uh, survivors of the genocide looking for homeless, orphaned... Well, everyone mm. was home... Well, yeah, I suppose even the idea of homelessness would have been meaningless by then, but uh, children without families, without any kin, mm -hmm. and actually gathering them together and tending to them. Mm -hmm. And he, he writes that he discovered that survival was not enough. Inside the survivor lived the need to care for others. Mm -hmm. And I found that very striking kind of realization that comes from the very heart of darkness, mm -hmm. that the kind of the profound need, and for many people it may feel like you and I, we're just being sentimental and delusional and we're talking about, you know, 
you know, the human being's propensity for, you know, goodness or for care. But you can look in the aftermath of a genocide and you can see people needing to give themselves to other people. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to survive. No. And I think in a, sort of, in a metaphorical sense, it's not enough for all of us to be safe, yes. right, in this world. Even if we're safe in our Melbournes and Idaho's, it's not enough. It's not sustainable for so many people anyway. Right. right. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's interesting, and he says in that book, the dead were beautiful. Hmm. What, and, and, it's, and you just go, oh, no. Oh, no. You can't write about the dead <laughs> no, like that. I think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you think about the place of beauty, unexpected, um, unsettling beauty in photographs that aim to document suffering? Some uh, kind. Linfield, Susie Linfield in Cruel Radiance writes really powerfully about that. She, um, and it was another one of those moments where I was like, oh no, I thought, it, I thought about it wrong for several <laughs> years in a row. But she talks about this argument about the aestheticization of suffering, making suffering beautiful, and the ethical problem people have with that. Well, you can't make that beautiful. It's a dead body, or it's genocide, or it's war. And she said, well then, if beauty is the problem, then the solution would be a crappy snapshot. <laughs> You know, that that's, again, like the the question about should I look, should I not look, should I look? It, it turns the attention towards the viewer when the attention needs to be on the image. It doesn't matter if it's beautiful. It doesn't matter if it's ugly. It doesn't matter if it's a crappy snapshot. What matters is the content. Um, there's people who've argued that beautiful images of suffering make people look mm. like it draws your attention. I'm not sure I agree that that's the case. Um, it might, I think... Uh, we have certain lenses through which we view images, and if you're looking at something as a beautiful object, it might make you respond one way. If you're looking at something in the way the torture photographs were framed in the United States, they said, warning, viewer, discretion advised, sexual content. It didn't say your government torturing people. <laughs> it said, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, in this it idea... concerned of, about the breasts. About the breasts, or like yeah. pixelating nudity as if the men in the picture should be shamed and our pixelizing would somehow protect them from our gaze. Um, you know, we have to really interrogate all the time the lens through which we're looking at images because those lens determine both the meaning we make and what we do in response to what we see. Um, I just want to turn our attention for a second, and we are... Uh, coming up to the time when I stop asking questions and uh, you are going to start asking questions. Um, and perhaps now is the time that you may want to think about, and again, just drawing your attention to a, an important distinction between the question and the statement. Uh, perhaps you can uh, begin to think about the questions that you want to ask Sarah. One of There are many, many great things about Sarah. One of them is that she speaks very fast, so she can actually get through, but very well, <laughs> so she can actually get through a meaningful number of questions as well. <laughs> so perhaps you can begin thinking. But I just have a couple of more things that I, I, I want to um, discuss with you, Sarah. Um, and I was thinking about the role of the photographer. So we've been talking about the photograph mm -hmm. and us, the viewer, and then, of course, people in the photograph who may be speaking to us in the future mm -hmm. and saying, this is an emergency. Can you see, can you see us? Can mm -hmm. you see it? Uh, but I'm, I'm also thinking about the, the photographer and um, uh, many, many years when I was doing research on the aftermath of the um, um, siege of Sarajevo, which of course um, happened in the 90s, uh, and the long, it's the longest modern day siege um, mm -hmm. in our history, and the city of Sarajevo, which of course is the capital of Bosnia-Herzegovina, which was newly created at the time, uh, is in a valley, mm -hmm. uh, it's surrounded by hills, um, it was um, completely encircled by uh, Serbian troops and, they, and there were many Serbian snipers perched um, on, um, the, on those hills around Sarajevo. And in fact, more people uh, died in Sarajevo from sniper bullets than, mm. say, from um, artillery shells and other forms of assault. Uh, on their lives. And there was an area um, in Sarajevo called Sniper Alley. It was like a big boulevard connecting the uh, city centre to some newer suburbs. And the only way, and it was completely exposed, and the only way to uh, move between the city and other suburbs was to run um, mm -hmm. through that area. And there is a lot of incredibly powerful writing, because a lot of, a lot of writers and poets and filmmakers um, 
stayed in Sarajevo and witnessed and did the work of witnessing um, and, you know, um, some of them survived, of course. Um, so as people would gear themselves up to run and sometimes couple would, couples would run together holding hands and it was, you know, it was real, um, you know, you didn't know what was going to happen at the end of that run. Um, and there would be photographers kind of training their lens because they knew um, there, would be, there would be great images coming uh, of the running, of the body being hit by a bullet and so forth. And I remember reading, and let me just quote him so I get it right, uh, um, Sarajevan poet Semizdin Memedinovic, uh, who uh, wrote, I'm not even sure whom to hate, the sniper or those monkeys with Nikons. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a story of a woman who runs across sniper, a, a true story, sniper alley, um, turns towards one of the photographers and she says, no work for you today, asshole. Mm. And I'm thinking that to me, you know, we talked about all sorts of kind of ethical and moral issues about photography, but I also think about even if the um, photographer is not training their lenses on the some kind of sniper alley, even if all they're doing, there is nothing predatory about what they're doing, they are photographing in place of something else, mm. in place of giving the... Um, and, of course, you have a moment in your book when a photographer is in the circle of a uh, man in Afghanistan and there is a man on the ground dying and all these other men with weapons are standing there. The weapons are aimed at the man and there is a photographer, his mm -hmm. camera, famous photographer, I'm sorry, I forgot his name. Uh, American Tyler Hicks. Yeah, that's right. His, his camera is, you know, gun, 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 camera, gun, gun, gun. Yeah. So I, I wonder about your thoughts about... Um, you know, when we think about, okay, so a photographer is participating in this, in the creation of new citizenship, and yet they are there taking photographs in place of doing something else. Well, I, th I think photography is an intervention. I think that um, in that example of Tyler Hicks, where it's gun, 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 camera, and a man is being murdered is what's happening. We only know about it because he took a picture of it. Um, so I think... I think um, photographers, especially war photographers, risk their lives to get images because they believe the images matter and they'll do something. Um, and they are what keep us from being able to retreat and say, we don't know. We don't know what's happening because we do know. We don't have that alibi of not knowing. Um, so I, I, I understand photography to be an act of intervention. And just because you're taking a picture one second doesn't mean you're not feeding someone the other second. There's that famous photograph of the child with the vulture. Um, and that photographer ended up, he won, I think, the Pulitzer Prize for that image and ended up committing suicide after that. But he, he's always criticized, how could you take a picture of a child who's starving, waiting for, with a vulture waiting? And he actually took care of that child after he took the image. So I think there's um, photographers who are in those places of violence do a range of kinds of acts that help tend and hopefully repair the world. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I think we're going to open it up. Uh, there are two people on both sides who are going to come up to you with a microphone. So we are not going to be picking uh, whoever asks Sarah a question. It's going to be specially qualified people. Do that. All right, thank you very much, um, Maria and uh, Sarah. Welcome to Australia. Thank you. I really enjoyed your book. <clears throat> Um, my question really is about, uh, you know, are these images um, of, for, for instance, we've seen the image of Ilan Kurdi who was uh, washed up dead on the uh, Greek beach, um, and that really galvanised people into action. We took 12,000 Syrian refugees after that. Um, but I guess w my question is, how do we tread this fine line between sort of portraying an image like that that galvanises people and then having images like from Syria of these um, blood-covered children that people are sort of becoming fatigued um, of sort of, a, I think it's called empathy f fatigue, and then they sort of look away. So how do you reach that hap happy medium, I guess? Happy medium is a funny word for those <laughs> descriptions. Um, no, I, I remember noticing when the Island Curdy photo became, um, became 
all over the newspapers and on our, our screens everywhere, um, that I noticed a language, a language shift in the United States. It went from calling people migrants to refugees. And I thought that was a testament to the power of that image. Um, but again, this idea of compassion fatigue or sympathy fatigue, I think that's actually because we don't know how to turn this emotional, it is exhausting if, if the only response you know to image is emotion, and of course you have to have an emotional response to these images or you've become something other than human. Um, we don't know how to turn that into action that, that matters. I think being able to take a specific, concrete, physical action, not just um, money, although money is an action, but an action in your neighborhood, in your um, street, in your school, that is in direct response to what you see, that stops fatigue. It's actually galvanizing. Um, and my opinion has changed about that since um, the election of our current president, I felt like oh, I just want to curl up in a little ball and go to sleep for, and I thought for like a year, because I thought it would be over. Um, <laughs> and someone said to me, what are we going to do for the next eight years? I was like, what are you talking? <laughs> eight, I, what? I, I didn't even think about that. Um, the only thing that has helped me is doing something concrete in my neighborhood that helps my friends and neighbors who are immigrants and who are more vulnerable than I am, to use my privilege in that way, to be uncomfortable, to do something that matters in, in a specific way in their specific life. And I think part of the power of never ending war is that feeling like I can't do anything, it's too big, I'm too small. Um, that, and then in which case they've already won. Um, and believing that the onslaught of images can the onslaught of images can contribute to despair and powerlessness and wanting to just go to sleep for eight years. But um, any step you take towards repairing the world, whether it's environmental, animal, immigrant, refugee, homelessness, whatever, they're all connected. They're all based on the same idea that some lives matter more than other lives. So if you take a small step, I think it um, matters on a larger scale. Thank you. Um, and thank you for showing people how to ask questions as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's an important lesson. Um, next, please. Surely there are questions, especially at the back. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling. Hello. Is this on? Yeah, hi. Um, you're a teacher still? Do you still teach? I don't. Okay. Um, if these issues are active for you about um, the ethics of uh, looking and its connection to action, um, how did that interplay with your role as a gatekeeper and in some sense a, a protector of your students? Um, I did understand myself as a gatekeeper and a protector of my students, which is why, and I, I miss teaching, which is why we would decide together as a group whether we wanted to look at an image or not. Um, and my students always knew they could leave. They could leave the room, they could look away. Um, I was in a conversation with someone earlier this morning about trigger warnings and how, how they work. We're obsessed with trigger warnings in the United States, and I always think that's interesting because in my experience, when people are traumatized, anything can, can trigger them, right? It could be a light bulb, it could be a glass of water, it could be a rug, it's not necessarily an image of violence. Um, so I, I never used trigger warnings, but we always talked together about what we were gonna see. And I um, talked about my classroom. I don't believe that classrooms are safe spaces. I think that they are safer spaces. Um, and I think they're places where we agree to keep coming together and engaging one another and holding each other accountable for the effects of our words. Um, in my experience, classrooms are places where racism shows up, classism shows up, sexism shows up, transphobia shows up, everything shows up. And instead of pretending like we do in the rest of our lives that those things aren't there, we actually admit the effects of those ideas, of those images, of, of saying things wrong, of being wrong, of having someone say to you, um, you, you hurt me, your words hurt me, you make me feel unsafe. I think those are productive and healing conversations to have. So that was the approach that I took in my classroom. I understood that we were a community that agreed to keep coming back together, even when or especially when it got uncomfortable. 
Thank you. Um, we have time for perhaps one or two more questions. We're not allowed to point at sorry. people, they told us. Um, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we're, not, we're not allowed to do this. My question really, I, I guess just going back to your having previously been um, training to be a priest, was just what role, if any, do you think that religion or organised religion has to play in countering the, the kind of things that you, um, that you observe in the world? Um, I think religious language and religious communities are some of the most powerful forces we have to create transformative change in the world. Um, I had a teacher, again, Gordon Kaufman, who said, the question whether God exists is the wrong question because the word God is out there in the world doing all kinds of work, having material effects on all kinds of bodies, and we need to be able to come up with better gods, um, which is why I continue to call myself a theologian. I think um, one of the key things religion can do is be um, a testament to doubt. If you believe that God is bigger than anything human beings can say about God, then our constructions of God will always fall short. They will always fail. They will always be flawed, infected with our biases and preconceptions and needs. You know, we turn, we create gods to do the work we want them to do in the world. Um, but it's a reminder, God, this idea of a transcendent God can be a relativizing function that reminds us all the time we could be wrong, we could be wrong, we could be wrong. Um, usually religion ends up working the opposite way. <laughs> I know the truth, I know the truth, I know the truth. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, in its best form, religion is like art. It's, it's a making exercise. It's a creative exercise with material effects. It's something we imagine it, that helps us bring into being a better world. So I think there's tremendous hope if we learn how to do religion better. Uh, if I can just jump in for a second, because I forgot to ask this question. Um, um, I think it's the penultimate passage in your book, and it reads like a prayer. It reads like an incantation. Is it? How do you think of it? Is it your attempt at creating better gods? I, I do. I, um, that passage, I understand it to be a prayer. I used um, the incantation of let there be, let there be, let there be, let there be. And to me, it's um, my gesture towards um, uh, the world that I envision and that I long for. It's, it's very, very beautiful. Thank you. Um, we may or may not have time for one more question, perhaps. So I'm sorry we're sitting here like blind mice. We are we actually can't struggling see. To, see, uh, <laughs> to see people because of the light. The armchairs are very comfortable, but the light is uh, piercing. So. Thank you very much to the... Am I on? Uh, to the Wheeler Centre and to you two for a most interesting discussion tonight. You've explicitly linked uh, the Abu Ghraib photo to one US president. Do you explicitly link um, uh, Alan Kundi's photo and James Foley's photo and the Rwanda photos to any other particular US presidents? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, uh, so far there has been no one with out bl blood on their hands, um, and I include that. I include myself. I I really miss Obama. I long for President Obama, um, but he, under his administration, drone strikes radically increased um, from something called personality strikes, where you go after an individual person and you know who they are, um, to something called signature strikes, which is killing people based on the signature of a terrorist, which basically means any male between 17 and 60. Um, and the, it's something called an unknown militant. Talk about introducing uncertainty that you refuse to see. You know, If they're unknown, how do you know they're a militant? Um, but so I think, um, yeah, no, we're, we're not doing a good job. Yeah, yeah. Can we end on a happier note? Yeah, <laughs> come on, a happy question and, for Sarah. And despite this, I'm, I'm actually quite delightful, even though I spend all my time talking about torture and photographs uh, of yeah. violence and war. Yeah. And There are many people who would attest to Sarah's delightfulness. <laughs> yeah. Some of them are in Australia too. So. Um, any uh, final quick question? <laughs> yeah, there's someone there. You spoke 
earlier about the connection between, about the, the way one responds to images in terms of action, how to get over the, the, um, you know, the fatigue of what we're seeing. And, um, and earlier you also talked about uh, the notion of kinship and the relationship between building your own kinship, you know, the action to build kin. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about, just give us a sneak preview to your new work um, and how it links to what you, you, you've just written. Um, sure. Um, so my husband and I are in the process of adopting a child through foster care, um, which is, I don't know if you have foster care here, but it's the children who've been taken away from their parents domestically. Um, and so I've been wrestling. It was a long decision to decide to do that. I'm married to a radical environmentalist who did not want to bring into being another human. So in order to be a parent, this was, I um, eventually came around to what is really the most obvious choice to care for the children who are already in the planet. There's 500,000 uh, foster children in the United States, half a million children who need homes. So we've decided to do that, but in the process I've been thinking about belonging, um, the way that things are related to one another that we don't think of as related, like the moon and the tides, or how trees communicate by root. Um, so I've been trying to think, think that through, and it comes from my interest in otherness, this idea from the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas that when you confront what is utterly different than you, when you have the sense that you're afraid or that there's something um, that you don't understand, that's your sign that you're in the presence of God and that you have to, to do everything you can to protect that otherness because it can't be replaced, because it's transcendent. Um, and that is the idea that stayed with me the most in the writing of this book. Um, so it's tracing, tracing both my journey towards becoming a parent and um, my thinking about the world as um, family, as all of us as family, from the birds, to the grass, to the tree, to the migrant, to the drowning child. Thank you so much, Sarah. Please join me in saying big thank, thank you, you to so Sarah. Much. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> Visit wheelercenter.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.